peace and love, peace and love family. I would say welcome to another Truth to Power talk, but this is not a Truth to Power talk talk tonight, right? This is a Black African Power lecture series that I plan on doing. And I'm going to bring on all of the master teachers, all of the master teachers, okay? I'm actually, you know, coordinating some stuff behind the scenes with some other master teachers. But tonight we have on our first master teacher. He needs no introduction. You know who he is, family. He is Baba M. Wally Moo Baruti. Peace and love, Baba. Welcome, 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 welcome to the platform. How you doing, Baba? Greetings, Dr. Maad. I'm doing wonderful. And I know that I'm still saying Dr. Maad. And there's a, I guess for me, a reason why there's certain words that need to be said over and over and over and over again because of the meaning that they have for us as a people. So I, I love the fact that you are Dr. Maad. I say, I say, and Baba, that means the world to me. You know, when the elders say that, that means the world. <laughs> Baba, that means the world to me. I was, I was uh, doing a lecture a couple of months ago, and mm -hmm. uh, I said to the crowd, I said, as long as the ancestors and the elders are pleased with my work, y'all can say what y'all want to say about me. I said, I don't care. And the elders started standing up, Baba, and they was mm -hmm. clapping. You know, I said, as yes. long as the elders and the ancestors are pleased with my work. That's what I aspire. So when you say things like that, it makes me know that I'm doing the right thing, Bob. It makes me know that I'm on I'm on the right path. And I know that if I wouldn't, if I wasn't on the right path, I know that you would tell me. Mm -hmm. And I, I appreciate that. And it goes, you know, both ways. Um, we are, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute anyway, but, you know, we, we're, we're people who validate each other. Mm. We give each other support of each other. So when there are certain people like my elders, when they tell me, all right, you know, you're doing good, what have you, I like that, blah, blah, blah. When they applaud, then I know that I'm doing, I'm not worried about anybody. Else. I don't care about what Come anybody on. else thinks. Come you know, my, my concern is with the elders, the warriors, the ancestors, the warrior ancestors. Beyond that, that's irrelevant. That's right. That's right, Baba. That's right. Yeah. And so, Baba, yeah. I'm looking forward. First of all, I want to say thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule because you were booked. Like we were going back and forth. You like, I got this. You, Baba, you booked and you got a lot of things coming up. Could you tell them about the complimentary conference that you have coming up? Well, the complimentary conference, we're really looking forward to it. This is our um, 20th. Let me pull out this calendar real quick to make sure. Yes, yeah, it's on the 3rd of June. Uh, we're we're really looking forward to this. It's it's one of those things we really get excited about because we want um, African people, African men and women who are serious to find each other, and you know for those who are already together to celebrate each other. Um, so we're we're really looking forward to this conference. We have uh, a number of things. It's going to be online, completely online. Um, we we are doing that now because we're able to reach more uh, people, mm -hmm. and they're mm -hmm. able, they're able to see each other better. Um, so we're really looking forward to, to, um, this conference. We're also looking forward, of course, to, um, my next book, which I'm hoping will be out by within a month and a half, Can't which wait. is dealing with the, the spirit of, of warriors, because that's an issue that, that needs to be, um, addressed from an African centered perspective. Um, I believe, even though it has already been, maybe I'll just say it needs to be, um, discussed from my perspective as an African center, uh, warrior, scholar, elder in training. Mm -hmm. you know, Bob, 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 let me ask yeah. you a question. How would this, yeah. how would this differentiate from your Asafo book? Cause you've written a book on, on Asafo. Mm -hmm. Well, Asafo was, was really for me, like a general definition of manhood from an African center perspective, because mm -hmm. I didn't see that clearly being articulated in our community. Mm -hmm. um, I saw people defining it whatever way they felt like defining it. And we need clear, concise definitions that are based on ancestral wisdom. Mm -hmm. Of course, from Asafo came Iwa, because even though you had the definition of manhood, there wasn't a clear cut explanation of what good character meant mm -hmm. within our community for our warriors. Um, this book is entitled Higher Ground. Uh, there's, there's not for me. Well, there are some, but there aren't for me um, a book that explains what a warrior spirit is supposed to be about. I'm not trying to explain spirituality. I'm not trying to explain any particular African spiritual system, but there needs to be a general understanding from an African centered perspective what a warrior spirit is supposed to be about. Mm -hmm. And the main reason for this is that there, I've encountered so many warriors who because of the way that religion has dealt with them, because of the way that the church has uh, dealt with them in terms of interpretations of, of manhood, they said, well, I don't want to deal with anything having to do with divinity, some creator, any of that. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And they, they're not, they're losing some of their power. They're not able to gain a whole chunk of their power because they're not accessing the center of who they are. So um, this book really is to deal with, with that issue and explain it in, uh, you know, always, as always, African-centered terms so we'll know who we are. And of course, just like Asafo and Iwa, uh, the book is directed toward warriors. Of course, the entire uh, community, particularly the frontline community, is, is written for them. But you always have to know who your audience is and who uh, needs the words um, the most. So it's, it's specifically directed toward them. Ashe, Ashe. Family, take a moment out to thumb up this video. Thumb up this video. Also, share this video. Bob is getting ready to talk to us about menticide. I'm getting ready to put his presentation on the screen. It's on the screen, Baba. So, family, menticide the problem. And then join us at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time this Wednesday for the solution, which is centered. Okay, so tonight, Bob is going to be discussing the problem, which is menticide. On Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, he's going to discuss the solution, which is centered. All right, family. So share this video. Share this video. Let's get this information out to the people. You know the saying, each one teach one. And how can we do that right now in the 21st century? We use our technology, right? It's easy. Just hit the button and you share it. And like Baba said, next, you know, 100 folks in the room, right? So let's get it out. Let's share it. Share it on Twitter. Share it on Facebook. Share it on TikTok. And guess what? Text your family right now, family. Text your family right now. Get on the text message. Send a YouTube link out to at least five people in your family circle or your friend circle, okay? Let's get this word out there. All right? Baba, did you, did you want to say something else, Baba? No, I'm good. I'm ready. I'm ready to go. You ready to go? Okay, Baba, the, the um, it's all yours. Okay, and I'm, I'm of course I'm honored to be here. Um, I think that this uh, two lecture series, if you will, is so appropriate uh, because you have uh, again the problem and then the solution. And I was brought up in a world where not only was I taught, you know, who to be um, like and, and what to be like when I grew up and who to hang around. I was also taught who I shouldn't. Um, hang around with who I shouldn't want to be like when I grew up. And those, those, both of those were vital. And I think that's missing a lot in uh, today's world. So I would say that in and of itself led to the writing of the book, uh, Menticide. And I'm glad that it's couched as being um, an understanding or giving us an understanding of the problem. Just like my, eye, the word Menticide is a word that we need to have. It's a word that we need to bring back. Um, and I'm, I have a definition of it, but still we need to understand that there are certain terms that we should have never let go of. We, we, we thought that we had made it. We thought that everything was, was fine and we didn't need these revolutionary terms because everything was good and uh, Urugu was back in love with us and we could move in with them and everything would be fine. And we didn't know in order for you to become them, you have to lose your mind. And that's one of the things that is discussed in or by Bobby, Bobby E. Wright, who is the, the warrior ancestors, the Jegna ancestor who coined this term um, for us. And I'm taking this from the first, I believe, first paragraph in my book, Menticide. And some people have mistaken Menticide, that word Menticide, as something that came from me. No, that came from Bobby E. Wright. Um, and I would strongly suggest that people read his book, um, uh, I'm not reaching for the book, Psychopathic Racial Personality. But also, if you can get a copy, uh, there's an essay, which to me is more important than the book. It's called Menticide, The Ultimate Threat to the Black Race. And understand why it wasn't included in the book, because it, there's, if, if for no other reason, well, number one, because this is a very serious essay. It's a book in and of itself, as far as I'm concerned. But the last paragraph in the essay says that blood debts must be repaid in blood. So I understand why it didn't make it into um, the book. A lot of people couldn't have gotten um, couldn't have gotten past that. But anyway, Bobby E. Wright, one of our wisest ancestors, and I'm going to do some reading because I want people to be clear. I don't. There are things that I don't want to miss. Uh, when I get to the definition of the Ma'afa, um, I'm going to be doing some reading and talking while I'm reading because I don't want any part of it um, to be missed. Bobby E. Wright, and that E should be capitalized, but Bobby E. Wright, one of our wisest ancestors, defined menticide as a form of insanity, which immediately takes me to Amos and Wilson because he's always talking about the depth of our insanity. 
as a form of insanity that leaves many of us thinking out of the mind of the European as if it were our own. It is the state of being psychologically brain dead and having one's thought replaced with alien ones. Menticide is derived from the root word menta, meaning mental or thinking, and side, meaning to kill. Fratricide, homicide, suicide, all those suffixes mean to kill. Menticide means to kill the mental process, to kill one's normal thought processes, essentially to kill one's own mind, in that there is still a thought process at work. And this is where a lot of people who are going through we're trying to get an understanding what the word menticide they miss. They just say, oh, well, you know, you're not, you're not thinking out of your correct mind. You're not thinking as an African anymore. But they forget that there's something that replaces that. It's just the same way we, we forgot or we were led to forget when these Africans left the plantations, when they escaped the plantations, they didn't run away. When they escaped these plantations, these prisons, when they reestablished community, they didn't just reestablish community modeled after the European, they established African community. And when we get this information, somehow that's missing. Somehow we are never taught those vital things that tell us we need to move back or go back in the direction. We need to sanctuarize, if you will, ourselves and return to who we are, not just uh, move away from the barbarity, move away from the pain. We need to build who we are. We need to recreate ourselves because that's who we are. And that there is still a thought process at work. It also means that an artificial alien collection of thoughts and way of thinking have replaced what has been altogether suppressed and removed. And I want folks to know this is a discussion of menticide. If we, um, when, when, when I did a course on the book menticide and, and pretty much every time that I came out with a book, I did a, a course, four to six week course. The menticide course went on for eight weeks. It was divided up in two separate courses. So what we're going to be talking about for the next, I don't know, half an hour, 45 minutes or so, this is only a taste. This is only a teeny, 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 tiny fraction of what we need to understand to understand the concept of menticide. So I say here, know that this is only a taste, but it is a taste for thinkers, that cannot be overemphasized. We need thinkers. We have enough rote imitators and regurgitators. We need thinkers. And the only way you're going to be able to think correctly as an African is to think as an African. And that means you have to understand the way our ancestors thought, how they interpreted reality. It is for those who recognize that with privilege comes responsibility. And what do I mean there is something we say to our students constantly when they forget who they are. To be in this space, not, not me, every one of us. To be in this space is a privilege that most people who look like us don't enjoy. Many, of course, don't want to enjoy it. They'd rather die than to be able to enjoy what it means to be African. But this is a privilege to have access to information like this, to be able to know that you are African and know that with that knowledge, it requires action to understand that our ancestors definition of wisdom required that you do for the benefit of the community with what you know, or you weren't wise, you were stupid. Okay. This privilege comes with a responsibility. It is not a responsibility to go and talk to morons, or I should say people who do not want to be African and would rather die than have to step in this direction. I'm talking about you have the responsibility to share what you know in the way that you know it with anyone who is trying to move in this direction earnestly, who's honestly trying to do it. So who are we? And this next statement is possibly the most important statement of this evening as far as I'm concerned, because it frames it all. Who we are supposed to be, but are not is the clearest indicator of the problem. We're supposed to be talking about the problem tonight, subtitled on menticide, who we are supposed to be, but are not. And most of us know who we're supposed to be. We have an idea and inkling of who we're supposed to be, but we're not that. That tells us what the problem is, because if we were who we're supposed to be, there wouldn't be a problem. 
we wouldn't be having this discussion. We'd only be having maybe part of the Wednesday Center discussion. So who are we? Just, I said briefly, all this is just a taste. In a nutshell, we're people of evidence. That means as African people, you don't claim to be something that you're not. Your community determines who you are based upon what you have done, the evidence, your history, your our story, if you will, tells them who you are. There has to be proof of what you say you are, what you claim to be, or what they, the credit that they give you, give you, or how they validate you. There has to be evidence of it. You just don't get it because you paid for it, or because you might look like it, or you want to steal it, or you want to loudly proclaim it online. We're people of evidence. There has to be evidence, or we dismiss it. This means that we're scientists of the first order. Whatever it is that we do, and scientists aren't, you know, just people walk around with white lab coats and white laboratories, they say we're white rats. There are people who study everything. All of us are scientists. They don't assume anything. They don't take anything, anything for granted. When you have people tell you, well, you don't take my word for it, you go and investigate for yourself, then us as a people, we go investigate it for ourselves. Even we know the truth of what that person said. We still go investigate. We don't close our minds just because one person said it. We are powerful, disciplined strugglers, and we have moved so far away from it. I remember the movement for us to stop saying struggling because it makes it sound so hard and painful, et cetera, et cetera. No, I don't know of any people of power or any individual of power who hasn't struggled to reach that point. That's how you develop your strength. You don't go to the gym and just look at the weights and somehow magically muscles just start popping out of everywhere. You have to work at it. And working at these things is difficult. And we've forgotten that. And we are instilling that nonsense in our children so that they believe that having to do something that they don't want to do or having to deal with something that they can't easily do or is difficult to learn that they can run away from or they can find somebody else to do it for them. They become weaker. We're weakening them by doing this. We are reality creators and namers because we are powerful. Um, I can't remember his name right now. He wrote the book Negro, the origins of the word Negro and blah, blah, blah. But it's a very good, very short book. But one of the things he talked about in there, which is extremely important, is the naming of things. Not a Marcus Mosiah Garvey talked about that. Naming things. People of power. Name. They name reality. They name the things in their reality. They name the ideas in their reality. Powerless people get named. Dogs and animals get named. So we're supposed to be namers. We're supposed to be creating reality. If something's wrong with this reality, which it is, okay, then we create reality. We create the reality to fit us. I remember reading, I don't know how many times I said, always surround yourself wherever you are with ideas, information, what have you, that's African. Everywhere you look in your home, everywhere you look in your space, everywhere you look in your vehicle, you should see us everywhere. That's creating reality. Because those images impact your mind. You're, you're affirming who you are and you're giving your mind instructions and it goes and finds more to give you. We are historically and historically knowledgeable educators, not programmers. We're educators. This is who we're supposed to be. We know what we're talking about. We might not have read every single solitary art story book. Might have just studied one and studied it well. So we can at least give or and have some idea of where we came from, the idea of who we are as a people. And once we once we lose that idea, it's over. You have people thinking that we can't be re-enslaved or this this can't be over. So they sort of lay back waiting for you know this miracle to occur to happen where everything just straightens itself up. No, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't a history, our story bears. Uh, well, the point it doesn't it doesn't work like that. Reality is created. The reality that we're walking around, suffocating in, drowning in, was the creation of the European mind. They made this happen in their own image. We are unconditional respecters of each other and our community. How are you, how are you going to have African community if there's no respect? If there's no no trust? And if we don't, 
don't love each other. And more than just saying, I love you. No, love also is an act. There also has to be evidence of that fact, clear evidence of that fact. So we respect and love those who respect and love us. We honor and respect those who honor and respect us at this point in time because we know where we're at. We know this is a place of deception, a place of grand deceptions. So we have to be very careful with our hearts, with our souls, because we know that this reality is anti-African and it's out to destroy us. We are perimeter defenders. If you can't protect it, it's not yours. I don't care if you're talking about your children, your spouse, your vehicle, your, your, your home, your space, your mind, your library. You can't protect it. It doesn't, it doesn't belong to you. Just because no one's taking it at this moment doesn't mean that it belongs to you. We are nation building sovereignty seekers. That's a, several lectures in and of itself because we need to find nation builders. Need to take words that are compound words that we forgot sidewalk, stoplight, we, we forgot underpass, we forget to take words apart because we assume their definition. We don't haven't made definitions for themselves because we're we're operating within someone else's dictionary. But nation builders means that you are building a nation. We walk around claiming to be things that we're not. If we're a nation builder, exactly, exactly, exactly. What are we doing to build this nation? The nation building is more than a conversation. Of course, you had to communicate, but it's not a conversation. You actually building something, building the minds of our children, building complementarity, building structures, building safe, sacred spaces where our families can be African together. And of course, as a nation builder, one of the most important qualities is the understanding their consequences are irrelevant. You're not concerned about what your Rugu is going to do because you know he's going to do he, she, it. They're going to do whatever they possibly can to stop you from doing whatever it is that you need to do to nation build. But that can't be a point that occupies our mind, that consumes our attention. That's wasted energy. That's energy that needs to be applied toward nation building. They're going to do what they do. They're going to do what they do. They need to stop us. Of course, the question there needs to be, why do they need so desperately to stop us from being who we are? Why do they have a history of that? More than anything else. And we are my eye. We have no other center. That is our African center, Ma'a. It was our ancestors' center. And I don't think we're better than them. I don't think we're smarter than them. There's two quotes by Amos and Wilson in terms of who we are. Because he's constantly talking about those who are trying to run away from being, who are trying to disguise who we are, trying to make what we are appear to be African or trying to find a way to dismiss being African so they can be European and then everything is okay. Both need to read self-hatred and self-defeat. And there are going to be some points in there, of course, like with his book, like with my book, like any author's books, that where you're going to see repetition. But, of course, we know being students that when an educator repeats something, that means that you need to pay special attention to it. He says the foundation of normality, being normal, the foundation of functioning efficiently, not wasting time, energy and stuff on stupidity. Its very first rule is to know reality. And there's so many things, there's a conversation, lecture, a course all in and of itself. To know reality. Okay, that means to understand the reality that you're a part of, this white supremacy aspiring reality, and to know the reality of our ancestors so you know what to create, know what you don't want to be like and know what you need to be like. Be in it, live in it, and base our behavior and everything else on it. He's not advocating European reality. He's saying we need to know it so we know how to navigate it as Africans. 
Africa is our reality. Our Africanist, Africanicity is our reality. I'm used to saying Africanity. Africanicity is our reality. Our blackness is our reality. Our history is our reality. Our oppression is our reality. People trying to run and hide from the fact that we're oppressed because they can't take the pain. So they individualize and act like it's not affecting them, just them over there, them over there. Any attempt to escape that, the critical point here, any attempt to escape that, get around it and distort it is an attempt and escape into madness. He also says any attempt to escape from the reality that we are Africans will falsify your consciousness will maintain the strength and power of your enemies and maintain the subordination of people of African descent. It's not a matter of you not doing anything and everything is cool. I'm not going to be pro-con, what have you. If you're not assisting, you're hurting. If you're not helping us, you're, you're, you're hurting us. You're damaging us. It's like you're already under assault and you're going to gonna, gonna stop. And somehow that's not going to affect the fact that the assault now has one less person or one less group of people trying to stop it. It means that we are literally crazy when we seek to escape from that reality. Because when we escape our Africanness, it means we operate on the basis of a false consciousness. It means that we operate on the basis of lies. It means that we see the world in a false light and therefore we become maladjusted, inefficient, and unable to function in it. Take advantage of it or use it to further for our further survival and our further advancement. Because we're expending all our energy and time validating, making theirs more efficient, adjusting to theirs, and taking the, trying to take advantage of theirs within the ceilings that we are allowed. So why are we who we have become? Why do we go from the pyramids to the projects? These questions that I get all the time, except for the black first one. Why are we measuring our progress from the point of enslavement and by our proximity to Urugu? How did we get from such a, a height? We chose? That's not to say that we weren't contributing factors because we lost sight of some things. But that wasn't the major factor. The major factor was invasion after invasion after invasion after invasion after invasion after invasion. After invasion. Indoctrination, after indoctrination after indoctrination after indoctrination after indoctrination after indoctrination. That's why we're where we're at now. Trying to pretend that we're not here. Trying to pretend that what they did is worthy of us. Trying to rest on their laurels. Why are we measuring our progress on the point of enslavement? Why are we stopping there? Except maybe somebody comes out of a book every once in a while saying, you know, look at the glory of Africa. And then we bask in it for a second, patting ourselves on the back. What Amos Wilson say? Solving our wounded, e solving our wounded egos. Trying to make ourselves feel better. Why do you need to feel better if everything is fine? We don't take the other end of the, 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 the logic. Why do I why do we measure our level of success on how close we are to Urugu, the hundred most influential Negroes in, in the country every year? Based on their connection to Urugu. Based upon them pushing philosophies that are Urugu's. Based upon them sleeping with Urugu, based upon them getting paid by Urugu, based upon them being loved by our destroyers. Which answers the question, of course, of why do we so glorify black first? We finally get around to doing what they've been doing, or you wouldn't call them black first. See, our children are stupid, they don't understand. 
what this means. They don't feel it consciously or subconsciously. That doesn't register. We are going to celebrating black first. What are the children thinking? Oh, we finally got here. Oh, automatically, without anybody saying anything, that means that white folks are ahead. White folks have already done this. We finally are getting around to doing it in their year 2023. All of this and much, 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 much more in terms of why we become this. I don't have a problem saying that this is what we have become because in order to, I was brought up in a, in a reality, a black community reality where I was taught that in order to solve a problem, you need to really understand the magnitude of that problem. You need to understand its source. You need to understand where it came from. You need to understand just how strong it is or you're just going to misstep and trip trying to solve something. You're going to end up rubber stamping it. How do we get to this, this low point? Because we are a product of the Ma'afa, the great destruction. And this, I would like to put to you as the core of my entire statement. And this is a three slide definition. So I need you to bear with me because if we can understand this really surface definition of the Ma'afa, we're not even getting into what the Ma'afa did to spirit because if your spirit, if you're a vessel carrying spirit, as many of us argue, then you're not disconnected from spirit. So if trauma, tragedy, horror, ugliness was a part of you and this affected your spirit, then it affected spirit. But we're not going to get to that level until, like I said, this is really a superficial definition. If you a surface, not superficial, a surface definition. If you want to take pictures of this definition, be my, it's in a number of my books. Be my guest. The Ma'afa refers to the entirety of the effort European people, people, they are one. I don't care how much they smile at you. I don't care how much they buy from you. They understand. If they didn't understand that they're at one, then we wouldn't be in the position that we're in. The guy in the candy store, excuse me, the, let's do it this way. The guy in the laundromat in L.A. and the guy in the laundromat in Houston and the guy in the laundromat in New York and the guy in the laundromat in Brussels. They're not communicating with each other. They're not on the phone with each other. They don't even know each other exists, but they're overcharging you, black folks, everywhere more for laundering your shirts and your blouses. They are one. The Ma'afa refers to the entirety of the effort European people have put into trying to destroy the African continent. Or we can say terraform it, socially terraform it to fit them. African culture and African people. Even though its inception, the Ma'afa's inception, predates the systematic invasion of the African continent by Europeans by about 850 years when Arabs began their enslavement of Africans for themselves and exportation to China and other ports, points in Asia. And now we've got our arms out, hands out, mouths out, applauding Asia for coming in to save Africa. Mind boggling what we will do, how we will rationalize our destruction and make it appear that it's deserved or that this is us doing it to ourselves. The European nation is our focus because they expended by far the greatest amount of energy aimed at bringing about our destruction. That's why I focus on them. Now, John Clark said, we have no friends. And I believe that my study of history and our story tells me that. Historically speaking, the Ma'afa is a massive, protracted crime against our humanity. And crime, I have it in parentheses because crime is a major understatement. I don't even know how you would put, what, what term you would use that would um, fit here in terms of crime. Crime is too soft. 
for what has been done to us. In fact, you even use the word crime. Okay, I went on with that here. In fact, you even use the word crime as descriptive of it severely minimizes the devastation it brought to African people. Holocaust is not even sufficient enough of a word. That's why I love when I see people say Holocaust. That's more descriptive. Be that as it may, the Ma'afa includes, here we go with the litany, and said this is surface. The Ma'afa includes the unprovoked wars of invasion to capture and subdue the African continent. All of these things impact on us, our mind. This is genetically encoded. The impact of that. You know, your ancestors considered to be a felony for you to scare a pregnant woman because they understood the connection between the mother and the embryo. And we don't understand the connection between what happens to us in spirit, why we've been given these instructions through my art to correct this nonsense, to correct this mess. The violent dispersion of African people throughout it, just the continent. The missionary efforts to remove us from our spirit. You break a people's spirit, it's a done deal. It's a done deal. They're through. If you can break their spirit as a people in its entirety, it's a done deal. You don't have to worry about them anymore. You got that back door, Carter. What's his back door? It's done. Spiritual back door. The consciously arrogant undermining of African cultural activities and sensibilities making it appear that our culture is inferior, archaic, old, outdated, and stupid. The brutal and inhumane capture of Africans for enslavement, regardless of whether we were already here. And the removal of Africans to other lands, not by choice. The colonization of African political systems, the balkanization of formerly peaceful ethnic groups and mass theft theft of African resources, turning us against each other with full intent, full conscious intent. We don't get it. They did this to the entire continent. Even the country that was never colonized, it's been affected. They did the same thing on this continent that we're on now. With malice and full intent, they started on the East Coast and they murdered their way to the West Coast using the same tactics, same strategies, same mind with every step they took. And we don't understand that this is systematic, that this is a people, that somehow they've changed it. Somehow this is just their barbaric ancestors, that they aren't their ancestors like we are, not ours. The confiscation of African lands and relegation of Africans to infertile soil. Let me talk about the things that they stole when you're talking about the mass theft. So many things of worth and origin in Africa are spread all over the European world. In private homes, museums, schools, everywhere. Safe deposit boxes. Bottles of alcohol in them. The global dehumanization of Africans and the brutalization, rape, torture, and murder of hundreds of millions. I didn't say thousands. We get the numbers wrong. Hundreds of millions of Africans and all the ascendants, I mean, those who came after, some people want to say descendants. All the ascendants of those murdered individuals, excuse me, those murdered individuals would have produced. We're going to look at that in a minute as well. It is important to note that most African-centered warrior scholars recognize that the Ma'afa is a genocide in progress. It hasn't stopped. Menticide continues to grow. The escapists continue to grow. The passing continues to grow 
It hasn't stopped. Africans who are light enough to pass for white, passing for white, none, none of that stopped. Read Clarence Muffin's Race and Reparation. He had a little nice little discussion of that in there. It hasn't stopped. This is genocide in progress. Which is the, I say that the other logic, I mean, I can't remember the, the last time I heard of a police brutalizing or killing a European on the street the way that they do us on a regular basis, one aspect of it. It did not stop with the official end of our enslavement in the Western Hemisphere, noting that the enslavement of Africans on the continent by Arabs continues to date. And we're seeing a rise and you're going to see even greater rise in the death of African women and girls. And now with the homosexual movement and boys and men. No African safe in European culture and society. Or the termination of colonization on the continent through revolutionary warfare. The continued efforts of white supremacy aspiring society to terrorize Africans into non-existence and the ongoing psychological effects of our past enslavement referred to by various terms such as psychic trauma, post-traumatic slavery syndrome, cultural misorientation, menticide, katha wa katha, et cetera, et cetera, as well as the ongoing ruination of the motherland under a heartless, alien, and alienating paternalistic capitalist imperialism are clear indicators that this has been and continues to be done, excuse me, to be one individual, indivisible, great destruction. We must emphatically note, however, that this definition is not to imply that this atrocity is near completion. On the contrary, it is to provide the broadest picture and give a clear understanding of what happened and is happening. So that the conscious African people will understand the magnitude of what we have committed ourselves to reverse. And in the process, the traditions and sanity to which we must fully, which we fully intend to return. If we're going to be sane, if we're going to be African, there's no, there's no shortcut to this. There's no halfway mark. Either you are or you aren't. There's no gray area. Here's another piece of this. Like I said, this is like a taste. Kobe KK Cambone did some studies. And in the studies, he looked at how lost we were as a people. In his original estimates, which is reflected in the dash line, the dotted line is very difficult to see. This is in the centered book. You'll be able to see it in the centered book. It's drawn in the end note, I believe. No, in the text as well. He originally argued in this most severely culturally misoriented. That means that you look to somebody else's culture as your reference point for your decisions, your aspirations, your lifestyle, everything. You look to another people for that. And sadly, the people who are killing you, who want you to be spiritually broken. It's like a horse. You bring in a wild horse, what's the first thing that you have to do to that wild horse? You break that horse. Once you break that horse, they're domesticated. All the wild has been beaten out of them. So now they belong to you. And they follow your every command. Even if you don't say it, they know because they know to anticipate your desire. So when he first did this, he said, most of us, you know, are moderately culturally disoriented. And there was a significant number of us who were minimally culturally misoriented, but there were a group of us who were severely culturally misoriented. And this bell curve sort of thing reflects that. He redid his study and it reflects the solid line where he said there's been a shift where more of us have become severely culturally misoriented. And we see that the ones who are moderately culturally misoriented 
has gone down. The minim minimal in this oriented, culturally misoriented group remains about constant. It remains about the same. But the severely culturally misoriented group has increased dramatically. And my guesstimates argue that that increase in the severely culturally misoriented group has grown enormously. And one of the main reasons we don't notice it is because it's become normalized. When things become normal, when behavior becomes normal, it could be the oddest behavior in the world, the most insane behavior in the world, but it becomes normal because that's what everybody's doing. And we don't even see it anymore. So we have the development of goo gobs, if you will, I don't even know if that's a word in the dictionary. Goo gobs. Many, 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 many. The Thor of Negroes in our community. Those who work against us. Who look like us. I just have two little quick quotes down here. Negroes are primarily used to manage the extraction of surplus from the African community. They're the first ones that you see when regentrification occurs. They're the first ones in the office, political offices, who start to push for aspects of regentrification. They're the cutting edge. They're the drivers and the overseers of the Europeans. It is characteristic of Negroes to inordinately overemphasize the humanity and moral integrity of Europeans by locating their worst behavior among Africans. It's not them. Look at us. No justification, no historical analysis, no historical analysis, none of that. Just that immediate picture. And that's all we see now because we don't think deeply. That's how you have all these morons online who are destroying our minds in service to Europeans. And they don't, most of them don't even recognize that that's what they're doing. They just know that that's what they need to do because they've been broken. Even if they're walking around with red, black, and green. Mud claw, kente claws, ox, that doesn't indicate that you're not broken. The politics of Negroes is that of spreading confusion. This is a list of the characteristic or qualities of Negroes. Progressively regressive, the epitome of compromised character. Truly vanquished, forgiving forgetters. Deracialized, deculturalized eunuchs, powerless negotiators. They're influencers, but not in the sense of influencing or being a fluencer like young folks are talking about today. It's a little bit different. They don't see themselves as powerful. They see Europeans as all powerful. And they see their job is trying to get close to Europeans so European, they can influence Europeans to use their power to help them. Sub-integrationists, sub-assimilationists, sub-amalgamationists, not at an equal level, but beneath. And they don't have a problem with that. Menticidal agents, collaborators. Another aspect of the problem, the rise of the diseducated. And we see this very clearly being an educational institute, and we hear it from every single solitary other educator we communicate with. Carter G. Woodson talked about the miseducation of the Negro. He talked about, excuse me one second. He talked about how we were being wrongly educated. That the things that we were taking, we were prizing in our education, even though they were things of maybe educational worth to someone, they weren't helping the African community. And he always used the example of Latin, the Latin of Latin. Well, how is Latin? I mean, guys walking around college and, and bragging and coming back to their community and bragging and ministers standing behind the pulpit saying all these quote unquote fancy Latin words, which nobody in the congregation understood. They just were proud of a person who could say a word that they didn't know. But the things that we were getting didn't help us to become powerful, didn't help us to liberate ourselves, didn't empower us. So we were getting educated and we were working at it very hard. But they weren't helping us to get free. They were strangling us. We saw our validation through European interest, European priorities. 
But what we've seen occur over the last 20 years, and this has a significant, well, let's say it has a lot to do with the spoilage of our children, is we're seeing more and more of children who have been socialized in a world where work is looked down on, struggle is looking down, looked down on. In fact, uh, Jacob H. Carruthers, Jedi Shemsu Jehudi, talked about it well in Intellectual Warfare, where the European idea of work was having somebody do your work for you. That was considered to be the real work. And our children have adopted this philosophy just like they've adopted Machiavelli, even though they haven't read the teachings of Bertahotel. To understand what it means to be African first. So we have working now on our second generation of people who hate the idea of having to think. That's diseducation, what I call diseducation. So we're moving, even though miseducation is still in the works in a major way. Diseducation is creeping in very rapidly. To have to try to motivate a child to want to learn because they don't know. That to me is incredibly scary. Spoilage, which this education is one little aspect of or outcome from, is the greatest disservice. I call it, I call spoilage, spoiling our children. Some people say I call that child abuse. And we adopted it because we wanted to be like Europeans, Doc Box, Doc Spock's book came out, and we just ran because this authority who of a people who can't raise their own is telling us to spoil our children, that we're we're um hurting them, we're hampering them, we're preventing them from reaching their limits by giving them guidance, by protecting them. You can't protect a spoiled child. And I bet you if somebody did a study, I bet you they would see a correlation, a positive relationship between the spoilage of our children and the theft of our children. Because spoiled children can't be kept safe. Because you can't tell them what to do. They go where they want to go. And they think that they are adults in situations that are unsafe. And then we walk around crying when they're gone. We set this up. And I'm trying not to sound, you know, um, like I have no feelings for people who are snatched. But we have to take responsibility for allowing this situation to occur. Yes, they, they destroyed so many of our men. Yes, our communities are in turmoil. But these are things that if someone else did it, we should be about the business of correcting. And I've never known tears to solve those kind of problems. We have to get to work or we're going to be crying a whole lot more. Spoilers breeds exploitability, breeds laziness. I've seen so much of that. Breeds willful, blind consumption because we're not, they never learned the difference between wants and needs and they're not in a place where the responsible adults are giving them any guidance in this area. It breeds weakness in the face of obstacles because all of their child childhood lives, whenever something became difficult they didn't want to do, somebody else did it for them, ran interference for them. So even those things they could do, people did for them when they didn't feel like doing it. That breeds weakness. That breeds an inability to handle the obstacles. We're supposed to be raising them, rearing them, to be adults, that's what education, that's what schooling is supposed to be about. That's what education is supposed to be about. Preparing children for adulthood. And we're preparing our children for childhood. We're preparing our children to be children for the rest of our lives. We're preparing our children for prison. For whatever else Yugu has in store for them. We're preparing our children to be on drugs for the rest of their lives. Because if your child cannot be controlled, and that's a whole nother discussion, when the state stops giving them drugs when they turn 16, 17, or 18, what, 
the system isn't going to be calling them for drugs anymore. They can just instantly stop. And they've been on drugs for 5, 10, 15 years. And then they're suddenly going to stop. Because they're grown. It breeds arrogance. Something that I hate most in people who pretend to be warriors. That, that is my number one pet peeve. It breeds vanity, narcissism, and a negative attitude. The number of children who I've encountered who brag about being diagnosed as having some mental issue. It's a point of pride. And I'm not going to blame them. They were brought up in a particular society. A cryogenic society. Cryogenic was a term that Amos and Wilson coined for us. The cryogenic society is a society that breeds an unnatural, excessive number of criminal types and behaviors automatically. A lot of the ethnographic studies, a lot of the studies of uh, modern immigrant groups coming from different places to this country and realizing, of course, in the studies that by the third or fourth generation, they've been thoroughly Americanized. One of the indicators of their Americanization is their participation in illegal activities. They come from a society where it doesn't exist into this society within, what, one, two, three generations, they're full-fledged criminal thinkers. And there are levels of criminality. But all of it's criminality. And I used to say to the, to the college students to, to try to get across the point, and they got it. I said, when, is, when is a lie a lie? When is murder murder? When is rape rape? In the Western mind where morality and eth eth um, ethics are irrelevant and personal or personally decided, it's only a lie or murder or rape when you get caught. And that requires somebody who is bigger, stronger, more powerful, more efficient, if you will, than you are. So if you are the bigger, stronger, powerful person, then you have the right to do whatever it is you want to do to whoever you want to do it to as long as you can't get caught. As long as you don't get caught. And then that's and that's correct. People expect that. <laughs> I remember um as a college faculty and um the college president ha was having an affair. And I'm talking to the students about it in terms of what that says about character, and they're like, Well, what's the problem? He's supposed to do that. He's he's like, you know. College president. He's a, he's a he's a powerful man. He's supposed to be doing that. You expect that a morally corrupt society. And I remember reading in grad school this idea that all Africans are criminal. The only ones who aren't criminals are just the ones who haven't been caught yet. That slapped me very very hard. And from there, I, I, this, this logic kicked in with me that unless you believe, looking at the statistics, and I had a number of criminology classes, unless you believe, because we're looking around, we look at the statistics, we look at the news, unless you believe that Africans are genetically criminal, that we're born this way, that we're born killers, thieves and thugs, as Europeans, the people who have manufactured this image of us historically are, you know something is dangerously wrong here. If we are disproportionately in the prisons, whole nother discussion, et cetera, et cetera, and we're going to talk about some of this in a minute. If, if we're disproportionately there, then it's either them or us, since this culture is them. Gun is on for African people, particularly African men. But I really don't want to say that anymore because it was, what, 2000 that the incarceration rate of black women percentage wise increased at a faster rate. Was, it was increasing at a faster rate than that of black males, which immediately brought to me the proverb, if they come and get your men at night, they'll be back in the morning to get your women.
And I would say to the students this morning. And for my essay, The Hunt is On, and I, those aren't my original words. I love the way that Curtis Mayfield put it in his song. We got to look, once you're in there, it's like permanent. This is this is part of this is the problem, part of the problem. We want to talk about the problem. Well, this is one teeny tiny aspect of the problem. Our relationship with the criminal justice system. Within the first half year, 33%, 33% of those who got out are back in. Within the first year, 44% of those who got out are back in. Within the second year, by the end of the second year, 50% of those who are released have been returned to prison. By the third year, 67.5% of those who were released, those who got out, those who did their time, served their time, they're back in prison. The system is not designed to do anything but to oppress you in every possible way, to break your spirit. And as scientists, which we all are, which we've already said, simple for me, a simple uh, scientific equation, which the youngest of folks get, that's what we got to find ways to make, give them things that allow them to analyze this world without requiring some, you know, major theoretical base. It's common sense. I say common African sense, common sense. And the logic is whatever percent you are of whatever society that you're in. So whatever percent black folks are of U.S. society, whatever percent black folks are of Brazil, whatever, we should be that same percentage of all of the good and bad, ideally. So if we're 12% of the population, I know we're more, but if we're 12% of the population, then we should be 12% of all the incarcerated people. We should be 12% of all the doctors. We should be about 12% of all the drug addicts. We should be about 12% of all the college students. And when the statistic, the percent deviates greatly from that, you know something is, is wrong. So if you're 6% of the men in the society, but you're 20% of the men who die on the front line of Vietnam, you know something is wrong. Dreadfully wrong. You can't deny if you're using that simple statistical model, which anybody can understand, and it makes perfect sense. So we're dealing with a criminal. Criminal is a descriptive. A criminal, quote unquote, justice system. And some people say a criminal injustice system. But it's a criminal justice system. You have people who are doing studies, to me, which are mind-boggling in terms of just having that as an idea to consider, to study. There was a study done of the probability of incarceration, and you see I have E-N. And also, so you'll see me have E-N when I spell inmates instead of I-N, because the inmates who I communicate with years ago said, well, enslaved means that you are a captive, but you don't believe it is correct, and you're fighting to get free, versus a slave means that you accept your situation, your disposition, you believe is correct. Well, we don't want to be called inmates I-N. We want to be called inmates E-N. So whenever you see that in my writing, you understand why. This study looked at the probability of you being in prison at some point in your life from birth, from the second of birth, from the second that you entered into this insanity. So an African female born in this society was 7.2 times more likely to be in prison than a white female born at the exact same time in this society. A black male, it was a 6.5% greater chance of you being in prison from birth. That's how bad it is. That's how deep it is. That's how calculating they are. I said, this is a few surface indicators which I think made people think, go beyond, hmm, racial differentials and sentencing based upon rape. The sentence that a rapist receives, black or white, 
when a black girl or black woman is raped on average is two years in this country. The average sentence for a white girl being raped by a white or black male in this country is 10 years for the rapist. Please tell me that racism isn't at work. I'm not going to talk about the next two. They would take too long. Well, I'm going to talk about the last one real quick. Intergenerational rape. This uh, I came across when I was in Chicago. And they um, came across it in some of the Chicago systems. I mean, the Illinois systems where sons rape having become commonplace in the prison system. Sons were getting raped by their fathers. Their fathers didn't know these were their sons. They didn't know they had been with their sons. They ended up raping their own sons in prison. And in one prison, they found evidence where a grandfather had raped his son and had raped his son, who was also incarcerated, had raped his son. They didn't know who they were. They didn't know they were related. Even if they did, that's irrelevant. That's not the point. <laughs> That should help us understand why mental side is so deep as a problem for us. We only get to what rape does to the mind of a male or female, a man or woman, a boy or girl, a toddler. This one also found interesting. Years ago, they could feel comfortable. Urugu could feel comfortable in saying that there were, in absolute numbers, sheer numbers, more whites in prison than there were blacks in prison. In 1991, that changed for the first time in the history of this country. There were more blacks in prison than there were whites. The relative amounts in terms of the percent of the population had always been greater for blacks than for whites. But the absolute numbers, and they were able to make arguments, liberal arguments, they're liberal people, liberal scholars can make arguments, well, you know, that's bad over there with the relative in terms of the percent of the population, but we still have more in prison. They couldn't make that argument anymore because in 1991, it's changed and the difference in the total has continued to increase ever since then. We think that is bad now. We think it is bad now in this country. The black folks in England look at the United States as, as heaven relative to the criminal justice system. When I went over there, I had opportunity to talk to some of the mothers and they sitting there crying. They, they were saying they'd made a mistake. Because Yerugal had convinced them that if they wanted their sons in gangs, mainly based upon what island they were from. If they wanted their sons to stop killing each other, then they needed to put stiff sentences on gun control, on gun laws, on punishment for guns. So the mothers, because they wanted their sons to live, they went along with it. These black women, they went along with it because they wanted their sons to live. But being the genius that we are, these sons said, cool, after a number of them had been arrested on these major sentences for just possessing a gun, they went to knives. And the knives did more damage than the guns did because most of the cuts, paralyzed, and all the rest of this, they lived through. We're back to the relative, the absolute, in terms of the percent that you are in the population should be reflected in the percent that you are in the prison system. In England, we only represent 2% of the population, but 16% of the incarcerated people there. 
and we can talk about the racism in Europe between North, um, Western, and Southeastern Europe, just among Europeans in terms of the incarceration of the pale Celtic, if you don't even know what the word Boston Celtics mean, the Celtics down to the Spaniards and the Portuguese and the disproportionate arrest and imprisonment of Europeans who are darker skin. We think that England is bad, go to Australia. Where every negative social indicator, we are the greatest holders of those records. Where crack is extremely bad, alcoholism extremely bad among the youth. Suicide rates there among young black males is beyond anywhere on the planet. Because the situation is so bad. In Australia, we represent 3% of the population, but 85% of those who are incarcerated. How do you spell problem? This is the simplest, most um, impactful to me meme I've ever made. And it came with a realization of what they're doing. I was reading about whitening in Brazil and the black boys in mass graves that they were finding the police were killing because tourists, white boys and girls from the United States didn't want to see these black boys on the streets. So the police in Brazil, in order to increase the tourism, begin to kill the black boys. They're still doing it. But this is the picture of the process of genocide, the effect of which you don't see for a while, because it takes a while. If a population is it growing, if you're starting to cut back and be growing because everybody's having four, five, six babies, if you say, oh, the population is large and you find ways to make people only have one child, it's going to take a couple of generations before you start to see a change in a pattern and the population begin to decline. Europeans know that if you can kill, if you can murder an African boy or African girl or have them killed or murdered, an African boy or an African girl before they've had a chance to reproduce, to have a child, then everybody that child would have produced is gone. Everybody, forever. And we know that generational growth is exponential. It's not additive, it's exponential. It grows in multiplicative terms. They notice and they act on it accordingly. I received a letter from a brother who's incarcerated, I don't know, maybe a decade and a half ago. And that's the only letter I've ever received from an incarcerated brother that made me literally cry. And this guy was reaching out, you know, I heard about you, Baba Baruti, and, you know, I just want to have some questions. At that time, I was answering le letters individually. And he said, can you tell me about women? He was 20-something. And he said, I've been in here, you know, since I was like 12. He said, I've never been with a girl. I've never been with a woman. Can you tell me what it's like? Because what I see in here, I know it's not right. Everybody he will ever produce or ever could produce isn't coming because he was in there on several life sentences without parole. I think this is the final aspect of this discussion where the problem is our mouths. The language that we use with our mouths. Where someone else has given us our definition, someone else has named our words. Words like civilization, and we take such great pride in being part of this civilization and the definition based upon how tall the high scrapers and how many bombers the military has. Instead of basing it on what our ancestors would say, the word civil being its root word. And civil is how you treat people. 
you treat people with respect, nice, that they, then this is civilization. So to call this as a civilization is a misnomer. It's not a correct word. It's not a correct term for this because that's not what it is. But that's what we say because we don't understand the words that we're using. We're not defining our words for ourselves. Selves. All of the terms we are using are part of the problem. Words have power and every single solitary statement is political. So we're using the words on the right. We should be using the words on the left. At least in the center community, at least on the front line, at least among the warriors, at least among the elders. We should be using words that we consciously, consciously have given great consideration to in terms of their meaning. Because we all know that when you, the normal, the idea that when you speak a word out, you're giving it power. Certain names shouldn't be used in our homes. Certain names shouldn't be part of our conversations. So somebody does something really anti-African and for lack of a better word, stupid in the media. And for the next two weeks, we're giving them power by calling their names continuously online to discuss them. There isn't some point where, where, okay, if you say their name in this context, then it gives them power. But if you say the name in that context, it doesn't give them power. Spirit doesn't operate like that, to my knowledge. It's like when you give your mind an instruction to sit there and try to figure out whether it's good and bad, it does what it's told. So we need to look at our language as a problem, not beyond the fact that, that this is a bastard language. We need to understand our language as a problem. We need to think carefully about every word that comes out of our mouths. It's not going to kill us. To stop and think. That's what we're supposed to be, thinkers, setting a standard of thinking. It's better than any out there. And I close with a statement that came from a young man, I believe, many years ago, but I love every love it. Put everything into context of the fact that we are at war. If you can do that. We correct this because you know why we're mentocidal. You know why we're in the situation that we're in. Baby Fodier. Baba, Baba, Baba. Hold on. I got to drop a bomb. I'm looking for, look, look, Baba, I was looking for my sound effect, but I was so into like <laughs> everything that you were saying. It just. Fire! Family, family, let's give it up for Baba. Let me see you. Let me see the fire signs in the chat. Let me see the fire signs in the chat. Let's give it up for Baba. Let's give it up for Baba. I, I mean, it, it, Baba, you, you like, you went all the way in. I was, I kept throwing in the chat and texting people. I said, Baba's going in right now. Family, let's throw the fire signs in the chat. Let's throw the hearts in the chat. Let Baba know that he was fire tonight. He was on fire. We appreciate you, Baba. I don't know if you can see the, the fire symbols. All no, you got to do is I, just, if you minimize, if you minimize your screen and just go back to the browser with, that, that I'm in, I'm looking at all you're doing. So like, yeah, if you go back, you can't. You can't. I can't. It's, it's all good, Baba. I see it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's all good. It's all good? Okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. I can't see you, but it's all good. I got you, Baba. Baba, okay. I see so many fire symbols. Ty 113, Tiffany, I see you, Immortal Truth, 100 Black, Rook, Rook, Late Show 42, I see you, Brown Girl from Boston, I see you, S.A. Smith, I see you, Brother Kufu, I see you, Brother Kufu, your logos are fire, by the way, A Beautiful Mind, Queen Mother, J-Way, 
every look, Baba, I mean, oh man, uh, Latasha. Oh my God, Baba, it was incredible. I, I'm just, I just see all the fire symbols. My aunt segment is in the building. It's just so many. Um, it's so many, Baba. Uh, it's so many fire symbols. You, 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 this presentation was was dynamic. It, it, it was breathtaking. I was just drawn into mm -hmm. you so much, Baba. I, I see you feeling with the computer, Baba. It's all good. I see. You. How do I? How do I stop the echo? Oh, you, you have an echo right now because it's two of you on mm -hmm. the screen. Okay, so, so I see I actually see three people. I see two of you, and then I see a uh you're sharing. Okay. I see you're sharing. But Bobby, you can go out and come back in if you just want to like gonna, close. I'm gonna go out. Yeah, go out. Just go out. Yeah, you can go out and just come back in. Okay. So I can shut down. You can shut yeah, you can shut down everything if you want. And then okay. like just click the link and just come back in. You can go right to our Facebook group chat. I see you. Okay, but you're still sharing your screen, so you gotta hit stop present. It's something that says uh, stop. Present. There you go, Bobby. Am oh, I back? Yes. <laughs> yes. Look, look, I, I, I'll, I'll I'll blame it on age. Look, look, no, it's, it's all good, Bob. I just want to show you the comments. So, so walk with me, Bob, real quick. I just want to show you the comments and show you the love, you know, that you've been getting, you know, from all the warriors in the building. So I'm just going to go through them, Bob, so you see them. Yes, I do. I appreciate it. I'm going, appreciate. going through all of them, Bob, so you can see everybody's name. Everybody's fire symbols. I'm just going through them. Family, I'm getting ready to drop the link in the chat. This is Q&A. If you have a question, you can come on in and ask Baba the question. All right. I'm going to open it up. The, open up the floor right now. And I'm dropping the link in the chat as I'm going through your fire symbols so he can see all the love. I'm going to drop the link in the chat. Matter of fact, let me do that while I'm showing everybody. I'm showing this. Let me drop the link in the chat, family. If you have a question for Baba, come on in. This is Q&A. This is Q&A, family. Also, make sure I've posted his cash app in the chat. It's dollar sign Y-A, I'm sorry, Y-A-A-M Peruti. All right. And I know some of you, several of you said that you already cashed at them. And I appreciate it. We appreciate mm -hmm. the love. We appreciate it. So there's his cash app family. Let's 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 show a love donation. All right, you know people pay for these type of lectures. You in college, you paying thousands and thousands of dollars at the community at the community That's at least do a love mm -hmm. donation, right? Let's do a love donation, family. All right, I'm going through, Bob. I see some people are coming in to ask you a question. Okay. All right, and so I'm just showing Bob the love family. Make sure you click on the link. Click on the link, and think about it. If all of us just sent Bob a Twenty dollars right now. He have over a thousand dollars. Family, let's let's cash app. Let's cash app it, family. Let's cash app it. Matter of fact, he have about sixteen hundred. If we all just said twenty dollars a piece, right? We all sent twenty. So let's cash app and let's show some love. Also, family, go to akabenhouse.com to purchase his book Centered. Go to akabenhouse.com to purchase his book Centered. I'm just going through right now, showing a lot of the fire symbols, Baba. Everyone's saying thanks again. They're saying it was a beautiful presentation. They said it was deep. It was powerful. So I'm just showing you the love, Baba, all of the accolades and giving you your, your flowers while you can smell them, Baba. Here we go. Look at this. Here we go, Baba. No problem. Look at this, Baba. This was beautiful. It was a lot of people in the building, Baba. A lot, a lot of folks in the building. And uh, we appreciate it. We appreciate it. I'm going to have to go back and actually listen to it again mm -hmm. because it was so much. Thank you so much, Auntie Segment. Mm -hmm. She said she already sent. Come on, family. Let's follow. Let's follow Auntie's lead. Let's get that mm -hmm. those cash apps up. All right, brother Chaos Rain Show. You have the floor, brother. Peace and black power to you. <laughs> good evening, everybody. Good evening, Dr. Martin. Good evening, Dr. Mamburuji. How you doing, sir? Yeah. How much? My question, Mentasite, the book itself, is mm -hmm. it like in a package now? Because when I went on the website like a few months ago, I was trying to find the book like itself, but it was hard to locate it. I see other books and mm -hmm. it's like a package. You, you get this book, this book, and this book. Is it not more sold separately? Yes, it should be under author's books, which I believe is like the first or second thing in there. It's got like, I believe author's books and then other's books. And then it has... Um, Packages. I know what you're talking about, um, but all all 28 books are in that author's books, 
as well as the work. Okay. The workbooks are in a separate thing. They're they're in a workbook thing, but I think it it should be. And if I can look real quick, let me. I'm going to go to nope. Go to Occupant House. This is not this is not a problem. Um, go to Occupant House, which is taking forever to load for whatever reason. Well, wow. it's never taken this long to load. That's what was happening to me earlier, Bob. But when I clicked on hmm. the link, I was like, I don't know what was going on. All right, cannot be reached. Oh, I'm not happy with that. Mm hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. Wow. What a surprise. Yeah. Let me try it from my phone, Bob, because it was happening mm -hmm. to me when I tried it on my on my browser on my on my desktop. So I'll try it from my my phone. Aquaben, AquabenHouse.com. And I'm trying it again, and it's not. Um, yeah, it's, it's idling on my cell on my cell phone. It's doing it's yeah. doing the same thing, Bob. So it's yeah, it's been fine up until today, up until now. <laughs> the Bible didn't I say it before we got on here? Didn't I say it's always something when we get together? Yeah. I said as soon as we get together, it's, it's something. Either the mm -hmm. connection is staticky, or mm -hmm. my Wi-Fi is acting up. Your Wi-Fi is acting up. Now it's the website. I said it's always, it's always something. But Bob, you could call whoever hosts your um your website and see what's going on. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah. Tomorrow. Yeah. I'll so be doing that. And I, I would ask folks, you know, just come back tomorrow. Okay, that's um, cool. We know okay, that. okay. Well, it's good. It's good for I mention it because usually that was one issue, so I wasn't sure that you were like out of books or some other technical no. issues. But it's good. It's good for I mention it to you now to yeah, probably absolutely. make sure. I can, yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. I, mean, I just want to say that I have uh, never been out of books, <laughs> so 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 they they are there. And if you ever have anybody, if you ever have a problem getting into the site. Um, just send me a message on uh, Facebook or, in, or email me at wallamoodbrewery at yahoo.com. Mm -hmm. And okay. I will well, I, reach out. I think, we, I'm not sure we're friends on Facebook. I think I'm friends with your wife. So yeah. if anything, if mm -hmm. I can't hit you on your message on Facebook, I'll hit her and she'll Absolutely. probably reach back to you. All right. Absolutely. All right. I'm let, I'm let the next person talk. Thank you, Dr. Mott. Hey, Thank no, you. appreciate you, brother. Chaos, and we miss you on the panel, brother. We miss you on the, the panel for the book club. You got to come back. Peace and love to you, brother Kufu. How you doing, King? You gotta unmute warrior. You gotta unmute yourself, warrior. Oh, oh. No, I was saying I'm on my cell phone, so the audio is coming through a little bit. What's up, warrior? Um uh Hotel Baba Baruti. Um yeah, powerful, warrior. powerful uh, presentation. Um I wanted to ask you to, you know, I have your book centered, and I um I don't know if you remember, I took your when you did the course on center, I actually took the class and mm -hmm. I, I think the most important part of the book to me, in my personal opinion, is your the end of the book. When you go into the role of elders, can you expound on that for the audience a little bit on the role of elders? Because um, um, on Facebook and in, even in my personal circle, um, I always talk about the importance of elders in the community. And you go into a very good description. And I actually use that for my base and my foundation of really vetting what an elder is. Can you kind of go into that a little bit? I would I would start out by saying that people need to uh, find the definition of a jegna, which is in, um, Asa Hilliard has it listed in his book and Ariel Robeson has it listed in one of his books. And of course it's in um, several of my books, but baseline to me, that's the definition of what an elder is supposed to be. Now, that doesn't mean that they have mastered all of those uh, qualities, but everything about them should indicate that they're moving in that direction extremely rapidly. Um, we have, uh, because we have become a people, and I said this isn't like a complete blanket statement, but because we have, be, as a people, have become inactive, we, 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 we talk well. And we do, and like every time I say, I have to say, I'm not saying we shouldn't talk. We need to talk. Right. But 
we have been that's become the balance that's become the whole thing so we're we're not um we're not judging people based upon what they have actually done many times we're judging people based upon how they said something how articulate they are or, or you know how they defended this point or defended that point so people who are in that lane such as myself you don't you don't you're not taken seriously you're not seen in a serious way um we need to judge our elders based upon what they they do in um sister wrote this book and she was um talking about the tactics and strategies that africans use on the continent during the time when we were being captured and brought here and in one of the discussions she talked about the role of the elders and i was really really impressed where the elders of course they don't have the stamina or the ability or the agility of you know somebody who's in their 20s or 30s but what in this story in this this uh, discussion she talked about how they would find the tallest trees and climb up as high as they could with bow and arrow and they would be picking off people from up in the trees he said, there was no such thing as a civilian you know and that's that's part of our that's part of the flaw in our attitude there's, there's no civilians in war i say that you know constantly so um we need to look at elders i think a little bit differently i think we need to judge elders uh, a little bit differently this this is not this is not a place where we um and i'm, I'm not getting at i think the heart of what the, the chapter was about but this immediately came to mind we're, we're we are acting like we're saying that we're at war but we're not acting accordingly so if we are at war, then everything that we do and everything we say, if, if I'm a warrior, then I need to be acting accordingly. If I'm an elder who's claiming to be on the front line, whether it's verbal or based upon what the assumptions are made about me and I'm not disagreeing with them, then we need to be acting accordingly. Uh, that is, is very, is very um, not critical there, is, is very useful there for us to distinguish between elders and olders where you know one the older they're just you know somebody's old and usually they have worked against us in some way shape form, fashion but the elder from the point of awakening since most of them are born raised bred what have you in african center homes from the point of awakening there should be a record of constant movement toward the sovereign african people um the the point that i really wanted to get out that um virtually no one has mentioned is that elders supposed to be the model of what warriorhood is. Mm. They're supposed to be our best model. It's in, in our tradition, if um, a young person committed a crime and an elder committed the same crime, the elder was punished more because the elder is supposed to know better. Supposed, supposed to have, you know, seasoned in this. He knows how that impacts his, in him as an individual. He knows how that impacts the society. He knows how that impacts spirit. He knows this. So he, of course, should be punished more severely than the younger person because he should know better, much better. Um, so from that perspective, the elders should be leading the front line in terms of their acts. That doesn't mean they should be out running, you know, young folks to get to wherever. It doesn't mean that they should be able to, to do, you know, the martial arts better. It doesn't mean that they should be able to, um, you know, get from point A to point B or what have you better. It just means that they should be providing the best example of what it means to be a warrior. You know, and that's, that's something that we overlook. It's like you, you um, to have elders who, um, are the best examples of fear because if something happens, uh, reading the book, um, A Gathering of Old Men, Ernest Gaines, and what did the elders do? The, the young man committed the crime, if you, if you want to call that a crime. The young man committed the crime, but the elders came in and they said, we did it. Wow. They shielded him. And that was that was automatic. They didn't they didn't really give any thought. They weren't concerned about consequences per se. But I don't see that among so many of our elders. There's some that I do. I'm I'm you know, and I'm proud of them. But the vast majority, well, I'm retired. You know, I'm I'm not, and I'm like, you retire when 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 the war is over and we have sovereignty. Come that's on, when, that's, that's when the retirement comes. So, and I, and I think part of the the problem is that that just doesn't occur to us 
is it's not something that we we would give a second thought to because we're not because we are militarily overwhelmed. Okay, I'd be stupid to say, well, let's pick up our arms tomorrow and and, and just start shooting. You know, most of us don't even know what targets to shoot at anyway. But um, because we are military overwhelmed, we have adjusted to the fact that we we can't win that we're, we're, we're in a way that we're losing because we can't come out out shoot them or out drop bomb them or whatever the case may be. So we have settled into this groove where even though we're not saying that we have lost our policies, practices, um, our initiatives indicate that we believe that we have. We're trying to find routes to um, power and um, self-esteem that make it appear that we're warriors without doing warriors' work. Okay. We're, we're being, being a warrior is not a conversation. Okay. Being a warrior means that something else happens when uh, the police, whoever, take down somebody wrong instead of pulling out a camera. Okay. And it's and it's not something that somebody should have a camera beside you filming you to show you just how you know bad you are. I remember um, when the rebellions broke out in the Atlanta University Center, uh, Morehouse Spelman, Clark Atlanta, Morse Brown, um, with the Rodney King decision, and um, I remember seeing one thing. I didn't know the student's name. But I remember seeing one thing and I said, okay, that's what warriors do. And I'm going to get in here. I'm advocating this. I'm advocating that people do what's right. Come on. Uh, this cop had uh, tackled this guy and was beginning to put handcuffs on in front of the front of the library. And this student, he had to have been a, he had to been a student because everything about him spoke student. This student walked across the street pulled out what to me appeared to be a nine, put it to the cop's head and apparently said something like, let him go. Cop held his hands up, the guy got away and then the guy just walked away. I said, that's warriorhood. That's, that's an incredible level of bravery in this reality for somebody to, for that to occur to somebody to think in a world we're calling ourselves warriors. Mm. Okay. That's, that's, uh, John Henry Clark said, uh, we're not ready for war. We're not ready to kill relatives. Mm. You know, so it's like when I'm looking at the elders, I'm surprised that some situations have occurred and they haven't set a higher standard of response. Okay. I'm not concerned. I'm not I mean, talking about I'm so bad and I do this and I do that. No, but there are certain circumstances where my grandfather should kick in. My father should kick in in terms of what they would do. They weren't concerned about consequences. And I've said so many times before, my father was like, yeah, go ahead and put your hands on my son. All I want to know, you know, is where he lives. And when I get finished doing what I need to do, then I'll come back, sit on the porch, and, you know, you can call 911 and I'll go wherever. But I have a responsibility. Not only to do what's correct, but to let him know this is what men do. They protect their community. They protect their women. Okay. They stand their ground. And I'm not, you know, I mean, maybe the FBI will be at my door tomorrow because I've said this, but it's like, I don't see this. Mm. And the elders are supposed to be the premier example of what it means to be a warrior. They've lived. Not to say I expect them to die tomorrow. You know, I want to live to be 152. But they've lived, so the loss to them in terms of to go to prison or getting shot is much less than what it would be for a young warrior who understands their work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not advocating elder black men, older black men, or one like pulling out their knives and going to work on. No, I'm just saying we need to think about this differently. Because our thinking is handicapping us. Our thinking is already handicapped before it even hits our conscious because we already believe that we are lost and we are afraid to die. Mm. 
And as long as we're afraid to die, then we're not going to do the things that our children will look at and say, oh, that's what warriors do. Oh, oh, I'm supposed to grow up and be a man. I thought I was supposed to grow up to be a mouse. I, I, okay, now I'm clear. Now I've seen what's supposed to go on. But the elder sister said, as long as, this is an older sister in this community, she said, as long as, she was talking about older black men. She said, as long as older black men don't do what's necessary to, you know, control, to empower the community, then our sons are going to be running around trying to figure out their identity. Mm. They're not going to know what to be. So, and I, I think that was an important chapter. That's the first time that anyone has brought it, you know, mentioned that, that chapter. Um, and I understand why. Um, and a lot of people probably read that chapter and they're thinking, okay, well, he's saying we need to honor our elders because they have done the work and blah, 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 blah. But that little part right there to me is extremely critical. And until we reach that point, outnumbered or not, those are one of my, my favorite movie is Always Outnumbered, Always Outgunned. And there's a reason for that because he understood what it meant to be a man. He understood that clearly. And people weren't going to push him, but so far, before he let loose. And there will be, he, his concern was not with consequences. His concern, the only consequences he was concerned with was what he thought of himself at the end of the day. Those only consequences he was concerned about. How he presented himself as a man to himself. And I would say to himself and to his ancestors. That wasn't part of the movie, but still to himself and his ancestors. That was his concern. That was his primary concern. And we need to really begin to, I think, focus on that contradiction so we can see ourselves for what we are or are not relative to what we're, we're, we're believing we are claiming to be. We're just kind of like hoping that we'll not be seen uh, in our air. We're, we're just hoping that everybody else's character is so flawed that, you know, my flawed character will just fit in. Uh, I've seen some changes among young warriors, particularly when it comes to the security of events, the security of African spaces. You know, they they are taking that deadly serious. I wouldn't want to cross their path. Um, but still, it's like the vast majority of those who I see who are assuming the, the, the title of warrior are hot air. Mm. You know, how can you, how can you, to, to me, it's like our women are being stolen. Mm. Our daughters are being stolen and raped. Our sons have been set up to be raped. Our children are being miseducated, diseducated in the school system. It's not safe in this community. Black women are leaving events with strollers and babies to a parking lot that's around the corner and no one's walking with them. Mm. Basic, fundamental basics of nation building are the strengthening of your community, making it safe. Wherever that community may be, no matter how spread out it is, it's supposed to be safe. And the elders are supposed to be saying to the warriors, why aren't you there? I'm here. I'm ready. You know, you're supposed to be, you're young, you're vibrant, you're ready to go, you're talking this talk. Why aren't you at these events? Why aren't you making sure that it's safe without someone having to call you to be here, to be present, to be online, to be on defense? As a, when we look back at our tradition, we call ourselves African, we look back at our traditions, the men handle the perimeter. You had to get through them to get to the women and children. The men handled the perimeter. They made sure that no one came through. And we have situations now where just that one aspect, there's no security. No security worth the time of day. Um, when I was coming up, it was the, the sign of a strong man was quiet. Mm. and this is one of the parts of socialization with that spoilage that has got us so that we can't produce warriors we can produce punks real well but we can't produce warriors 
And the reason why the silent man was so honored was because all of his attention was on the environment and the safety of the community. He didn't talk a lot. My, I think my, my, my father was one of the, I think maybe we had like two, three conversations in my life. But I know this man loved me because I was always secure. Always. I was in the yard, in the house, where I was at, I was secure. And if he wasn't present, he could be there in five minutes or he would send somebody to be there in five minutes. The level of security, even in the Negro community back then was enormous. And we need to connect that with that spoilage. How are you gonna create a security force among boys who are given the decision as to whatever they want to do, whenever they want to do it. And you're going to now tell them, I want you to be security there. Why, am I, why, why should I be concerned with, with, with their safety? I want to play my game. Don't tell me what to do. Mm. And we set this up. They have set the stage and we have been played. We have been played. I want to have the boys that particularly online. We were talking about something having to do with security or survival, or whatever. I'll find a way to that teachable moment. And I say, okay, let's let's just pull up on Google um, women's archery. And I pull it up and I just scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll until it says there are no more entries. And I say, where the white, where, where the black girls? Mm. Not a single one. And I'll go where it says. Of course, I did that the first time. It really threw me. And I didn't think about it when I was looking for it. And I said, men showing their sons how to shoot. And every picture that comes up and I scroll for them. I just scroll. I don't say anything. I just scroll. And they see all of these pictures of black males trying to show their sons how to shoot basketball and white males showing their sons how to shoot guns. Mm. And then I look up gun competitions for youth. And I scroll and I scroll and I scroll and I scroll. And the sad part of it is not that the parents aren't taking the initiative to make sure that their children are prepared, like white children being prepared to kill them, even though that's bad enough. These children have become spoiled to the point of self-centeredness that they don't even want to, just like, and? I showed the children a video, um, and this is not the group of children we have now, but I showed some children a video of the video that someone made where they were contrasting twerking with uh, for black children and, and shooting for white children and the same. And you can see them side by side. You got the black girls and, and the black boys twerking. And over here, over here, you got the white boys and the white girls shooting. And their expression is like, OK, and. Mm. Because their parents, even though their parents know, let's see parents in African attire fully into their books, et cetera, et cetera. And their children don't even know that we're at war. Mm. So this to me, the elders are part of that. I can't tell my, my, my daughter what to do with her children. She knows and she's not remiss. Okay. But I can't tell her to, you know, make sure your children know how to use weapons, make sure your child, children know how to make, you know, bow and arrow out of PVC pipes, you know, to make sure your children know this. No, I taught all that I could so that she's prepared to pass it on. But I see evidence that most of the folks who are talking this African stuff mm. are not passing it on, are not taking on the, the, the mantle, the responsibility of educating their children. And I see the elders, some who I would argue are, and I would, I would argue this is in a way acceptable in this reality that they're afraid to interact with the young folk because they, they feel threatened by them. So that calls for somebody who's in the middle to bring those two together. That's that to me is a solution to that. But the role of the elder in our community has always been, you, you know, you know I, I haven't read about any punk elders in our tradition. I haven't read about any elders who quit or said, no, you shouldn't be going to war. Mm -hmm. I haven't read any of that. I haven't read about any mamas in our tradition 
who, you know, didn't bring up their sons or urge their son, their husbands to, to, to get busy. If our situation is this bad and this this um, lecture series was was couched in the, in the correct terms, mm -hmm. problem, solution. If our situation is that bad, which it is worse than. Mm. If our situation is that bad, then we've either quit with the goal of being subsumed into European culture and society within their beds with them to love us so that we can not be no longer be seen as African or who we are. Either that. I don't even know what the other side of that is because that's the majority of what I see. Mm. That's the majority of what I see. And, you know, people say, well, you shouldn't be saying, you know, all the bad stuff. I'm not going to sit up here and talk about what's wonderful and great about us by itself. Come on. But the majority of, of what I see is not good. And I'm not talking about the kind of cars we drive in, the kind of houses we live in, or the, whether we, you know, 100% vegan or what have you. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about our mentality relative to our survival. The ma'afa is in place. It's entrenched. It's entrenched in our hearts. It's entrenched in our souls. It's entrenched in our minds. And we're acting accordingly. You want clarification on that psychologically? Read Wilson. Read and understand Wilson. Read his the psycho, uh, psychologic, psychology of self, hatred and self-defense. I shouldn't know the title by now. Any of his books, particularly the Green Book. Okay. Pan-African, you know, uh, Pan-African consciousness? No. African Center Consciousness versus the New World Order. Read that one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's especially for warriors. Then you understand and you might look at the world a little bit differently, look at us a little bit differently in terms of what we are actually doing. There should be an African centered school in on every block, just like every church and liquor store. Facts. There should be one Facts. on every block. And we have people who talk about it for years and finally get around to making something or maybe developing something. And it's not worth the time of day because it's designed to track children into the Negro world into Urugu's lap because our, the priority is so many of these schools, uh, Baba San Yikas uh, made the point many years ago, the, the, these, these schools that are not about the business of uh, sovereignty, not about the business of nation building. They're just trying mm. to make our children so that they um, don't get slapped too hard with the racism that's going to come at them. Mm. How can you, how can you be afraid or relinquish your children to this system when you know, when you know, not you guessing, you studied, you read, you listened, you've experienced, mm. and you relinquish your children. To me, that was just like this. Uh, we had a young man who was here who stood many years ago. His parents both were on crack, they were in prison. His aunts and his grandfather, uh, they were like, eight or nine siblings, his aunts and his grandfather, they put forth the energy and effort to get him in Akaban. And he was in Akaban for like two years and he was in a constant rage. He was in a constant rage and we we worked on it. We worked on it, worked on it. By the time he left, he had lost a, penny, a piece of it, but he still was in a constant rage. He was mad because they weren't raising him. They weren't rearing him. He was, you know, he couldn't let it go. Mm. So he left and he got, he got everything that he came from. He was so mad because he had been, you know, left by his parents and they were on drugs. He came back to visit uh, a few years later. He needed me to sign a paper for him to be in uh, um, ROTC, which of course I didn't. Um, but I'm, and this, this, is, this is part of the story. I've lived a life of drugs and alcohol. So it's like anything else. When you have done something, when it's part of you, you know when someone else is doing it. Right. It takes one to know one. Right. He walked in the door. I could see he was high. And then he got close enough. I could smell. Okay. And then one year later, I find out he has a child that he's not taking care of. This is us. We know <laughs> this has been done to us. And we're putting our, he's setting his own son up for 
the same anger, frustration, and hell that he went through. Those of us who know the, the behavior, the attitude, the, 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 and what we do should be different. Our level of sacrifice should be greatly different than what it is. You know, and I applaud those who are doing I mean, he's the serious worker. One of our most serious ones. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He should not, he should not be abnormal. He should be the norm. We should see him everywhere. Every community, we should see these schools everywhere. Absolutely. And we have the skills, we have the talent, we have the ability. We just, we just afraid of the consequences and we don't want to do the work. Ashe, Ashe. Peace and love to you, Bob. I mean, what are your closing words? Peace, peace. peace. Oh, hold up. I'm outside on my porch. My little motion light went off. Uh, <laughs> you going to close Baba. us out, Baba. You going to close hey. us out, Baba. Oh, okay. Well, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. I want to say Madasi, you know, saying Asante Sana uh, for our great warrior, uh, uh, Jagna, uh, uh, teacher, Divine and Mwalimu, uh, Baruti for uh, such a dynamic and powerful presentation. It was yes. captivating. It was yes. informative. It was standard bearing. Uh, 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 and, and man, it was refreshing, you know, yes. and, and, and serious. And, and so, uh, thank you for that. You know, I didn't move. I was like, okay. Same here. I was, fro class, class I, I, I was frozen. Session. I yes. was frozen. Like, yes, yes. You know, <laughs> classes in session, you know what I'm saying? And I just want to employ everyone out there, you know, to get serious you know, and stay serious about our sovereignty, stay serious about uh, embracing our youth, embracing our future uh, and in and, and the future of African centered education, you know, uh, uh, and that would have that would have been my question. I know I got closing remarks, but uh, uh, my question, question my, my question, question Baba, is where do you see the future of African centered education? Where are we going as, 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 as an African centered educator, as a centered ed African centered educator, uh, 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 with Uhura Academy, of course you have mm -hmm. Akaben, uh, Institute, mm -hmm. you know, where do you see us headed as a community, as a collective in African centered education? Beautiful wow. question, Baba. Um, <laughs> that's an investment, something my mother said a long, long time ago. She said, black folks don't rise until they've been pushed down so far. They have no choice. You know, and that struck me as a as a child. Um, I think our situation is getting worse mm -hmm. as as a people. That um, as bad as that is, I believe that, that can have and is having that can't have is having a positive impact on us building these schools, of us doing the security at these schools. You know, so I I'm I'm um, very optimistic. The uh, only thing that I have said to folks, uh, especially ones that are walking this direction, be careful of who you bring in because some people are only there because they're running away from that. And as soon as that appears to change, they're going to go back. They're going to run back. So we, we have to, I guess, find ways, and that's very difficult to do, but find ways to make sure that whoever's coming in our door is serious as having a proven record. We can't go any further than that. You can't, you know, judge a person's mind, but Baba, when you say whoever's coming out door, are you talking about teachers, students, parents, or all three? All, all of them. All, all the above. above. Okay. okay. All the above. Okay. Because because a child can come in if, if a child is serious enough, determined enough, uh, they don't want to learn, they've been spoiled enough, they can come in, they can seriously do some damage. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't expect it. I, I expect to be able to, you know, give them reason. But a, a child can do, some serious damage, can do some serious damage. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm like very, um, I'm very optimistic, you know, and, and like you, if I wasn't, I'd be through with this, you know, I, there's, there's a house that has a rocking chair, <laughs> you know, and, and I can chill, but I believe, I very much believe. And if, you know, if I didn't believe any, I would be popping me upside the head, you know, no, get the belief in. So I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic and I'm not trying to, to you know, raise you up Baba but when I look at people like you and the consistency with which you do your work and the expansion you don't you don't stop you see you you look for the, the needs in the community and then you start to fill those needs that's the work of an educator you know, I said stuff up and then you do the work that is a model that I think and I think we have good models now um 
We've had good models, but I don't think we've had models that are this determined at this point in time. Um, and those who want to do this, they're losing some of their fear because of those mm -hmm. models, because of the work that they've sure. done. So I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. Good, thanks. Good, thanks. Good, yes, thanks. thanks. Great job. Great job, Dr. Mike. You, what are you bringing it? <laughs> hey, hey! Yes, I had is. to look, look, Baba. I had to call on the the, the master teacher. Yes. I said, Baba, Baba, I need you to come on for this for this series. He said, Okay. He said, Okay. <laughs> and that's why, Baba, I'm telling you, Baba Baruti, I I just appreciate you. I do, I do, I do. I don't think you understand how much I appreciate your time, energy, and wisdom, Baba. You know, I I do appreciate you, and and just because you don't have to do it. You know, I mm -hmm. I'm one of those folks that believe that people don't have to do anything for you, but when they do something for you. You know, say that you appreciate it. Say thank you. Show gratitude. Show thanks because they didn't have to do it. And so I appreciate mm -hmm. your time, your energy, and your wisdom. I pre appreciate all of your works because when you were talking mm -hmm. about, I mean, about people coming through the door, my mind went back to your book to educate the people. And, mm -hmm. and you talked about the types of teachers, right, mm -hmm. that should be educating mm -hmm. our children. You talked about student selection. You know, you talked about parent parental involvement in the educational process. You talked about the mm -hmm. community. So mm -hmm. family, shout out to, I'm telling you, get this book to educate the people. It's, I mean, it's a, it's a great read. It's a thick one, but it's a great read, Baba. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like this big. So I haven't gotten through all of it, but mm -hmm. I've read it. It is so powerful, Baba. I mean, it's, it's like, it's right there next to my Right next, right next to Blueprint for Black Power, it's like oh, right see. there. It's it's right oh, there. Oh comment. yeah, it's it's right there. It's right <laughs> there. And I and I'm looking that's forward, Baba, to your next book. What's the title of it again? You said it's oh, called Higher Ground. Higher Ground. And mm. when can we when can we expect that to that to drop, I was, Baba? I would say a month and a half. About a month and a half from now. Okay, oh, Baba, when it when it drops, you got to come on back, and yeah, you know, absolutely. and then we have like a virtual release party, and absolutely. get some folks to come and get copies and absolutely. stuff like that and get out would there, Baba. To. I think that I think that would be hot. We'd and the complimentary you. conference is June the third, June the third, June the third. And it's yes. going to be virtual and people can yes. contact you at Bob and Wally Mubaruti to get Facebook, the date to, or Facebook to get more information yes. on the complimentary uh, conference. All right, Baba, I'm going to let you close us out. What are your closing words, Baba? Baba oh, um, I'm, I'm with Baba Amin. I keep bringing him into the conversation. I'm with, I'm with Baba Amin when it comes to you. You know, people need to understand the work that you're doing. They need to understand the um, what you worry about the consequences of doing this work because mm -hmm. you know that they're watching, you know that they're listening, you know they don't love mm -hmm. you. They don't. So, so to be able to do this in the face of that and in mm -hmm. the face of some who look like you, mm -hmm. who are trying to undermine what you're doing, um, you should be applauded. You should be supported. Mm -hmm. We need, you know, we need your voice out here. We need that voice going. I know that there will not come a time when I won't hear your voice. But you need to also be showing appreciation for the work that you're doing for us. And I'm honored Not to be on here. That's why when you call and ask, I say, when? You do. You do. You do. And Bob, I appreciate it. I so appreciate that. And I appreciate your words. And I appreciate your support. You know, I appreciate you vetting me. And, you know, remember, <laughs> and look, Bob, I mean, you know how we were talking about how Mama, Mama Marimba always talks about vetting. She's, you know, oh, yeah. She don't play. She yeah, don't play. Yeah, yeah. Who who vetted you? Who who vetted you? <laughs> yeah, you know, yes. so she doesn't play. And so I appreciate, you know, I appreciate that, Bob. I appreciate your words, you know, and I appreciate you saying, yeah, like yes, you know, yes. appreciate it. Appreciate it, Baba. And so, Baba, so you're gonna be back uh Wednesday at 7 p.m. Yes. Two days from now, family, join us back here at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the solution. So tonight, Baba unpack menticide, which is the problem. But on Wednesday, family, he's going to return at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to unpack the solution, what is, which is centered. What does it mean to be centered? And Baba, I mean, I didn't tell you this, T. Baba Baruti's book, Centered, is now mandatory reading for conscious ingenuity instructors. Baba sent, Baba, Baba sent a pack. Baba sent me a pack. I'm yeah. going to go purchase the pack. I'm going to pick up the pack from the post office tomorrow. And my conscious and you know the instructors, they all going to be taking a picture with his book. And so that's uh -huh. mandatory reading. So if you want to be well, one of my instructors and my, and I made this clear when I had my interest meeting that you have to be a, you have to be centered. They say, well, what is center? You know, they, they, Dr. Bailey, wow. Dr. Bailey was centered. Mm. I said, okay. I said, that's okay. We, I'm going to train you up real good. You're going to start by reading this book. 
And mm. so, and it also, Baba, I'm going to make it mandatory that they join on Wednesday, that they listen I to say. your lecture on Wednesday. So my conscious ingenuity instructors will be in the building this, this, uh, this Wednesday, I said Saturday, this Wednesday for the lecture on Senate. So family, make sure that you join us back here at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time this Wednesday. Also family, thumb up the video. Don't just come in here and get all this good information. Thumb up this video. You know the way the YouTube algorithm, share, algorithm works. Share, share, yeah, share. Yeah, you gotta share. Good. You gotta share so that it continues to populate on, the so it continues to circulate on YouTube. Also family, mm -hmm. Share it, share it, share it on all social media platforms. And then lastly, family, if you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so that whenever I go live or upload new content, you are notified. See you on Wednesday at 7 p.m., family. Peace and black power. A Bibi Fahodie, a Huru Sasa. Freedom now. Ashe. Ashe.